So thank you very much. Uh, Laura is Senior Policy Counsel for New America's Open Technology Institute. Uh, she previously held positions as a staff attorney at Public Knowledge and a clinical teaching fellow at Georgetown Law. And David is also a New America fellow, currently writing a book on the impact of algorithmic and computational methods on public policy and social life. Uh, he writes the weekly Bitwise column uh, on Slate about technology and used to work at Google and Microsoft as a software engineer. So thank you both for coming very much. Um, so algorithms and the law. What is, Laura, I don't know if maybe you want to start on this. Um, why should we be worried about the ethics and the law of algorithms? Great. Thank you. Th and thanks so much for having this panel. Um, so I think so a good place to start maybe would be to talk just a little bit about what this panel is called, which is the legal do's and don'ts, or I guess the algorithms and the law, the legal do's and don'ts um, of big data. And I think something that, a, a good starting point to talk about this is to, is to say that um, when we're thinking about problematic uh, outcomes from uh, innovative uses of algorithms, a lot of times there aren't really clear legal don'ts. Um, so, you know, I mean, I am a, I am a policy lawyer here and I, I approach this issue from a policy perspective and I think so that's why this discussion will bleed a lot into um, more broadly ethics and what, you know, what we think some, some policy approaches might be. Um, but so to, to answer your question, one of the issue areas that I work on a lot here at, uh, at New America and the Open Technology Institute is consumer privacy. So I, I approach this um, uh, in part from the perspective of someone who cares a lot about um, ensuring that, um, that those who are collecting data and using it are doing so in a way that's consistent with consumers' expectations when they share that information, um, and that it is clear to consumers uh, that they are sharing information, what purposes it'll be used for. Um, but I, I also think that uh, uh, just a topic that you brought up a little bit in the last panel and that the panelists started to talk about, um, this idea, it, it's really important for us to talk um, about this idea that uh, we could be using algorithms to generate outcomes that, um, that perpetuate human biases uh, or, or otherwise have some sort of disparate impact um, on, on different communities of people in a way that, that we would find problematic. And, and to come up with ways to, uh, to address that. So uh, just to, to give one example of that, um, I, in the last panel talking about quanti quantifying ourselves, there was some discussion of, of Fitbits being used by health insurance companies or, or you know, some, some other um, measurement of, informa of information about the body being used by health insurance companies to calculate discounts that, that some um, that some consumers, some insured, might qualify for based on their um, their healthy activities or their lack thereof, I guess. Uh, car insurance companies are doing this too. So some car insurance companies now will uh, offer a program where the insured can agree to have a device installed in their car that will measure information about how they drive, um, which the insurance company might then use to calculate scores for that, for that individual based on their driving habits. So the things that they associate with safety. So they'll look at things like acceleration and deceleration, how the car takes turns, um, the, the average speed that this driver drives and, and how that speed compares to other drivers that are on the road. Uh, but one, one of the categories that many of them consider also is time of day when the, when the car is in use. And I think this, this makes sense because, um, or one, one could, might assume that in the wee hours of the night, um, many drivers on the road could be um, drunk or could be tired and accidents on a, on a per capita basis, accidents are more likely to occur in the middle of the night than during the day. But if we're providing car insurance discounts uh, or premium, discount premiums um, to individuals based on um, the hours of day when they're driving and we're providing less, if we're having higher premiums for people who are driving in the middle of the night, then that's gonna have a disparate impact on folks who are working the night shift. And um, folks who are working the night shift are disproportionately uh, poor and of color. Um, so I think this is, this is just one example. There are, there are a slew of examples of this nature. Um, but you know, as we're thinking about ways to take, um, to take data streams and 
innovate uh, new uses for them you know, that might make a lot of sense for, to, for example, a car insurance company. Um, I think from a policy perspective, it's important for us to evaluate uh, when the outcomes might be having um, a, a disparate impact across communities that we as a society would find problematic. Right. So just to tie this back into the discussion we were having earlier, I mean, a few minutes earlier, we were talking about privacy and sort of the question, can you safeguard your privacy? Can you keep people who you don't want to have your data from having your data? And what we're talking about now, and this is something that I believe to be the case, is that the, the discussion about privacy is kind of lost. We've kind of lost privacy. I mean, lots of the people who I know who are thinking about this stuff essentially say, let's not even think that, talk that much, about, not, not give up on privacy altogether, but the, the fact is that so much of our data is now beyond our control that rather than worrying about whether or not we can get it back, what we need to worry about is how is it used? And in particular, is it being used in ways that inadvertently discriminate against certain groups? and cause social inequities. And that's essentially the, the point you're raising. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, agree, with, I agree with that in part. I, do, I mean, I, st I still think that there are, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a yes and, right? right? You know, I mean, like, yes, we need to think about possible ways to restrict use or, or at least to monitor uses of data um, and think about problematic outcomes and try to pre pre prevent them. But I also think that, you know, it's, it's, that doesn't negate the importance of ensuring that, to some extent, um, uh, information collection is at least consistent with, with consumers' expectations, and ideally that they have real notice and consent about it, and, and, that, and that we try to limit um, aggregations of data from disparate information uh, sources where consumers might not expect that the, the downstream aggregation will take place. David, you have an example of, that you wanted to talk about as well in relation to this. Yeah, so I think Laura's done a great job of covering uh, some of the legal and policy implications with regard to disparate impact. I think that uh, the issue of the sheer opacity of these algorithms, not just to their users, but sometimes even to their designers, is, is, worth, is worth dwelling on in that we think of algorithms as having easily accessible results, and yet um, we often aren't even sure of what criteria by which algorithms are the, out, the outputs of algorithms are evaluated, or if they are at all. I mean, if you think at Go if Google, for example, you know, who is it that checks to see whether Google search results are accurate? Well, to some extent, the user does by clicking on them, but that doesn't refine them to any sort of precise degree of capacity because you're only going to click on one, and we're accustomed to seeing you know, irrelevant Google search results even on the first page sometime. So the feedback mechanism, which is required as algorithms get more complex and non-deterministic, is a very imperfect model. And in some cases, it seems that people aren't even trying to set up that sort of a feedback model. And the, one of the big examples today that I'd cite is in ed tech, where there's a big push towards um, automated grading of student papers. And we've seen a lot of... Um, we, we, we've seen a lot of sort of results-driven teacher performance testing over the last 10 or 15 years ago, uh, 10 or 15 years or so, and it's met with very mixed success because the question is, you know, are these the right metrics? Are they being measured correctly? Is it in fact, you know, forcing teachers to, you know, teach in a suboptimal way just to meet basically uh, a seemingly reasonable but in fact arbitrary and misleading set of metrics? Well, that becomes, not only does the use of algorithmic grading of papers sort of reinforce you know, a notion of false objectivity. But you also have this issue that uh, the claims made that they can grade as well as teachers. There's two components of that, which is do we know what it is for, <laughs> for a teacher already to grade a paper well, given how badly uh, you know, teacher assessment has been over the last 15 years? Second, are we in fact making the correct comparison? And certainly from what I've looked at, um, I don't think there's a lot of use to that claim. I don't think that uh, the claims that are being made that algorithms can grade papers as well, assess papers as well, really stack up beyond you know, a fairly simple syntactic level. And yet, I don't see a lot of questioning on them. There are meetings going on, and people and ed tech companies are pushing for this stuff, and you know, institutions of education are signing off on it without you know, having the literacy to look at whether that assessment is being made correctly. 
The other half of that, though, is let's say, for the sake of argument, that the computers actually are doing you know, a reasonable job. Uh, I, I don't think that they are, but even if they were, would we understand the criteria that are being used? It's not enough to just say, oh, well, they're grading it, and you know, they're just doing as good a job as a teacher. If there's no feedback mechanism to put a check on that to say, look, you know, are these algorithms being trained to continue to assess student papers in the way that we think is right? The algorithms aren't going to regulate themselves. Uh, yeah, algorithms don't exist in a vacuum. Just as teachers get feedback and exist in an ecosystem of learning certain methods of pedagogy, algorithms need that ongoing set of pedagogy as well and standards to refine themselves. But we have, I think, you know, collectively sort of a false notion, and in some ways, you know, this is sort of the legacy notion of algorithms as sort of static, deterministic, set in stone, platonic entities. And going forward, that's going to be that not only is going to become less and less true because we're seeing increase in machine learning algorithms, and I think we have a machine learning expert who's coming up next who can speak to this better than me. Uh, but it shouldn't be static because, in fact, the only way for machine learning algorithms to improve is if they are getting uh, a well regimented and explicitly defined set of feedback saying whether or not uh, the results they're producing are accurate and in which cases they are accurate. And I don't think any attention is being paid to that, certainly not in the case of, of, of ed tech and of grading in these cases. Right. And I think you're getting at the, what is essentially the worry about entrusting anything to algorithms and especially to machine learning algorithms, which is. Sure, this algorithm may, on average, or for a large proportion of the population, do the job, whether it's grading papers or setting insurance premiums or setting prices or whatever, may do the job, on average, better. But in the cases where you feel like it's done a bad job, how do you appeal? Because you can't ask the algorithm, why did you reach that decision? Mm -hmm. As you said, often even the creators of the algorithm don't know why it reached that decision. And so there's that process of the human in the loop who lets you say, hold on, there's something wrong with this decision has been kind of removed. I would go further than that and say that it's these, you know, these decisions <coughs> are not purely descriptive or, or, um, uh, or, or sort of objects to be examined, but they have a certain prescriptive impact. That is to say, if these decisions make themselves into the wild, they will start to have a prescriptive impact in terms of us seeing them as correct. Mm -hmm. Because we will tend to, if we tend to take their outputs as correct, we may not be, you know, we aren't going to be seeing every individual case. So if the assumption is this generally produces good results, that will actually be prescriptive. And we may indeed change our standards to be closer to sort of whatever emergent results this has been producing. Uh, and, you know, not, and those won't be based on sort of values that we necessarily, that, that we appeal to because the computers aren't aware of them. Right. Okay. So what do we learn from examples like this? Um, so I think there's there's a few things. I mean, one one I was actually touched on uh, on an on an earlier panel, but is is worth repeating that I think it's it's worth remembering that um, our a lot of times the algorithmic insights are statistical insights and not logical ones, right? So this is sort of like the uh, the distinction between uh, correlation and causation, where um, <coughs> you know we might want to design an algorithm that will um, that will out, that will predict what category you might place the measured individual into for for something like car insurance or something. Um, but the 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 data that it, the the pieces of information that it will use to link one individual to the desired category or to whatever the category it associates it with. Um, those those might be based on a on a correlation a statistical correlation and, and not and not on causing I'm sorry here let, let me let me provide an example I mean, on this can, this might the car insurance example provides that right yes, I mean it's sort yes. of like you are right. a higher yeah. risk in quotes because you drive at night but you're not exactly. driving at night because you're a risky driver you're driving at night because you work the night shift right exactly yeah so so the the car insurance example provides that because you have the person driving during the wee hours and the reason that we're worried about someone driving during the wee hours might be because we would be concerned that they could be <coughs> intoxicated or could be um, overtired and uh, so yes yeah, so of course there is a statistical correlation between driving at night and being more accident prone but it doesn't necessarily mean um, that this particular individual is more accident prone is intoxicated or 
uh, or overtired during the, the time that they, that they drive char characteristically. And I, you know, I mean, I think there are, there's some other, there's, there's a, a related thing to think about here, um, which is also that accuracy is not, this, not necessarily the same as fairness. And there are situations where we might, we might come up with a, a model that provides us with um, sort of statistically accurate outcomes that we as a society would not think of as fair. So an example of this um, might come if we're, we're trying to design um, a, way to, a way to sentence convicted criminals in an, in an automated way, right? So uh, let's say that we take a bunch of information about a lot of people who've been convicted of crimes and, um, and, 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 and try, to, try to extract from that information, then also, also look at recidivism rates and try to draw associations between um, pieces of information about convicted individuals and recidivism rates. And let's say that we find an association um, between recidivism rate and, um, and county of birth. Right, so, so then it, would it be okay to, to come up with a, an automated sentencing um, algorithm where in part the way that you're calculating the sentence for a convicted individual um, is, is based on where the, the, their county of birth. Like I think you know, we probably would say no. I think, I think most of us would probably say, well, it's, that seems awfully unfair. You know, it seems awfully, that's something that, that an individual can't change about themselves. It's not the fact that they were physically born in the geographic location of that county that makes them more likely to recommit a crime, um, it's probably some associated factors. So, you know, so the fact that there is a, a statistically significant association between these two factors um, uh, doesn't, doesn't is, might, that might make it, you know, might make us think of this algorithm as accurate, but not necessarily fair. Yeah, do you have something else to weigh in on there? Yeah, I think, I mean, not only do I agree with that point, but I think that we also need to look at exactly how we are defining accuracy because, you know, to sort of, like again in, in the Google case, to sort of hold these things up and say, okay, well, you know, this is an accurate set of results belies the fact that, you know, these results are often configured based on a test set of information and extrapolated from that. And without an ongoing feedback process, there will be a one-way prescriptive direction. So a lot of what will happen going forward is, I think, you know, when we talk about data being out there, there's the, there's the issues of collection, there's the issues of promiscuity of the data sort of flowing between entities, you know, without us having any control of it. And there's the issue of use in terms of, okay, when can certain data sets be used to make certain decisions? And, um, with regard to that, you know, if you have a certain if you have a certain input, like say your medical data going into an assessment, say of uh, your health in some regards, we would say that that is reasonable when we're looking at making a medical diagnosis. And in that case, you get feedback in the sense of okay, well, you know, in general, one can look back on diagnostics and say, okay, well, was that diagnosis accurate or not? And you know maybe you don't get to make the maybe you don't get to make to assess the diagnosis to a completely fine degree, but in general, you know medicine has these feedback mechanisms set up so that if the patient dies, you say, okay, well, where did we go wrong? Uh, and if you think of a medical diagnosis and treatment as that sort of an algorithm, you can see how it's an, it becomes an iterative process. And if you think of the need for an iterative processes rather than simply static algorithms that affects what, what it is to be accurate here, which is not having sort of reaching a state of accuracy and freezing that in amber, but rather taking a state, uh, taking a state as you analyze something like you know, a person's uh, recidivism or a person's you know, uh, job skill or something, looking, uh, taking that measure, having a way to say, okay, well, given that metric, how has the, how has, uh, evidence after that fact impacted our assessment of that, and was that assessment correct? Not just should we update that assessment, but to what extent was the decision made incorrectly in the first place? And because these decisions are being made so much en masse, it's not, we won't be able to ask, you know, so my own background is, you know, I worked on systems and at Google, I worked on, I worked on the web crawler, and 
systems people have sort of a bias against machine learning because <laughs> when if something goes wrong in machine learning, you, it's very hard to fix it in isolation. You just sort of nudge it in one direction in sort of the, the Cass Sunstein sense. So that's that's one way in which they're more like humans. Unfortunately, most people, you know, systems people go into computer science because they want to work with things that aren't like humans. So it's very frustrating <laughs> to uh, to to suddenly have to sort of you know nudge things instead of just fixing them. You want things to go from zero percent to a hundred percent. But increasingly, when you have systems that have an ongoing evolution, that's not possible. You need systems that have automated feedback mechanisms that in sort of a, uh, you know, a probabilistic framework can say, OK, well, the system produces the wrong diagnos diagnosis in some sort of way. Here is a feedback, and it should weight certain factors less or more heavily in the future because this was a wrong outcome. And the challenges there are A, to establish that it was a wrong outcome in the first place, and B, to figure out what changes should be made in response to that wrong outcome. And that twofold problem is, I think, uh, issues in sorts of in with regard to with respect to algorithmic refinement that people are not thinking about, especially in regard to mission critical usages, where I think the systems model is predominant, but it's starting to fail to scale, much to my and much. Can, much can to my you give a more concrete example of, of that? Uh, of which part, where it's failing to scale, or uh, I mean, I think you see it. You know, um, I mean, the classic example probably at this point is you know the financial collapse in two thousand eight, where you had these 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 trading algorithms that uh, were supposed to maintain a certain sort of homeostasis and not let us get certain uh, to a certain point out of risk, and yet when situations were set up in a certain way. Uh, Basically, they, they zip past what were supposedly what we thought of as the limits that they were respecting and went through them. And yes, we got a bit of feedback that allowed us to refine those algorithms when, when all hell broke loose. It would have been much nicer if we'd gotten more incremental feedback and had been able to modify them in an ongoing incremental fashion rather than having all of our illusions torn up before our eyes. Right. And I think that you know it's it's in the financial sector that you see these algorithms in sort of their most advanced form, but they and they provide sort of a glimpse of what's coming in the future. Right. I How want to ask. That? I want to ask if there is. Um, how shall I put it? Is there? You, you, you talked about how, especially machine learning algorithms are kind of more like humans in a certain in a certain limited sense, but is there the possibility for them? And I don't even really have a sense of what this would look like, but is there a possibility for them to be able to take better, to, to take decisions that do correct for those, for biases? Um, so here's sort of the background behind my question. As we all know, in the 70s, there were uh, the mandatory sen sentencing laws in the US, um, which were intended as a way to introduce more fairness, um, to remove judges' abilities to, to bring bias into their sentencing. They had to give certain sentences. And of course, the end result was the massive rise in the black prison population, um, an unintended consequence. So there was an example of you know, where there was an attempt to do fairness, in theory, but that backfired. We've, you've talked about, you've, you've both talked about how accuracy doesn't equal fairness. And you've said even the question of accuracy is, is, is dubious. But is there a way in which algorithms can be used that they can correct for those biases and push towards fairness? I would say yes. I would say, and I mean, I, I mean, there. One of the things I hold up as sort of a gold standard of of data studies uh, is is a study that was done by Andrew Gelman on NYPD data, in which he showed that even having corrected for for uh, for for a lot of uh, for a lot of variables. Uh, racial profiling still existed, and uh, certain minorities were stopped disproportionately on the streets of New York as, as a consequence of the stop and frisk policy. And I contrast this with <coughs> studies with a lot of the you know big data studies that get that that that, that get bandied around uh, that I would say are suggestive but should never be taken as as conclusive. One of which, for example. Um, you know, search, Google search queries reveal that there is a very high proportion of uh, searches for racial epithets in the Utica media market of upstate New York. Um, and this is a very interesting piece of data. It's, it's surprising. But 
all it can do is point you towards further, you know, more detailed investigation. Right. So it really becomes a question of can you constrain the variables to the effect that you know what, bi what the biases are that you are trying to correct for. Right. That, you know, it, if we are aware of the biases in a situation that we wish to correct for, then it becomes possible to take those variables and put the and, and quantify them in a more formal manner to look at okay well you know is stop and frisk being applied fairly or unfairly but if all you have are variables such as google searches then it's like okay well what is it to be fair or unfair what is it to be biased or unbiased is what I, what you take as a suggestive measure of bias genuinely a measure of bias so i would say that the answer to your question is an unqualified yes but that if anything, uh, but that that potential must only be realized with a great deal of care and attention being given. And that that is one of the reasons why we need sort of an increase in algorithmic and data literacy. Right. Well, so that. So, oh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I was just going to I was just going to also talk for a moment um, about a study that probably a lot of people in this room are aware of, and that was um, uh, Latanya Sweeney's research of where she she found that um, searching for searching for black identified names on Google uh, was much more likely to to turn up search results that was like that that said something like find arrest records for Latanya Sweeney um, than searching for white identified names and uh, so she's she she did I I believe that uh, so she found this to be the case pretty universally, regardless of, of what name. It, she tried many, many names, um, many, many characteristically white names, many, many characteristically black names. And by that, I just mean you know, statistically more likely to be um, in, in names of individuals who are black identifying versus white identifying. Um, and I, I believe that the standing hy hypothesis that she has on this, and it's still not entirely clear why this is the case, but I believe that the, the standing hypothesis is that um, because the, the search algorithm will promote search results that individuals are more likely to click on, then if searchers are racially biased and are more likely to click on search results to, for finding arrest records when they're searching for black identifying names, then over time, the, over, over time the algorithm will learn to, uh, to, to promote those, the, arrest record adver or the arrest record search links um, uh, for black identifying names versus white identifying names, and I think you know. Th so this is this is an example. This it's very difficult to correct for this, and I think David and I talked about this a little bit the other day. And it's just like I, you know, what do you what do you do about like that's the search the way that the algorithm learns to promote links probably makes a lot of sense. It'd be very difficult to um, to to to. This, identify all of the issues in which human bias is entering into search results and then I don't even know if you would want to eliminate the, the circumstances where there is bias or maybe it's maybe it makes the search algorithm more useful that it does promote um, search results even when when bias is present but uh, but but one thing that I think we can take away from this is that algorithms can also illuminate some of our human biases like the, I mean the, the fact that this was taking place and the fact that she found it to be very clearly statistically significant and consistent um, uh, can can help us think about what biases we are bringing to our searches online um, and it, I mean you could you could come up with hypothetical examples of this in other contexts too let's say you have a um, an, a, an employment screening platform that is helping you uh, where you know you have your candidates for, for a job for a job an open position that you have posted um, upload their resumes their applications to this platform and uh, and based on which ones you look at which ones you mark as um, candidates folks that you're interested in interviewing and um, whether or not you ultimately follow through and hire them, maybe over time it will learn to promote candidates to you at the, at the top of your, of your inbox, as it were, um, that you're more likely to want to interview. Uh, you could, that might be a, a, useful, um, a useful mechanism for it, but, but let's say that over time it learns that you are less likely to interview individuals that um, belonged to an American Law Students Association 
in law school. Well, if I don't know how many lawyers are in the room, but most of the American law students associations in law school are, um, you know, the African American Law Students Association, the Asian American Law Students Association. So let's say let's say that it actually identifies that you're this that you're less likely to interview candidates who belong to an American Law Students Association, and um, and over time. Uh, the, it, it is no longer promoting candidates who have that in their resume, that if, if you could analyze the data afterwards, you might actually find out that there is racial bias in the, uh, from, from the perspective of the person who is making hiring decisions. Um, we could build in a way to check for things like that. You know, I mean, it, it, it would be worth building, thinking about how we could build in ways to check for bias and to, to identify it to, and to reveal it to the employer. I mean, maybe I'm doing that and I don't realize it. Uh, and it, there are two things that could happen. One, my, this, this employment platform that I'm using um, could perpetuate that bias and never tell me about it and in fact actually um, obscure it from me by making, by, ma by making it seem as though it is objectively in, uh, evaluating candidates based on um, cold hard facts about them. Um, or maybe it could be designed in such a way that it could identify those biases and show them to me so that I can try to correct for them. Right. Okay, so that's a sort of somewhat hopeful slice of the future <laughs> where we can use algorithms to illuminate, as you said, our human biases. Um, but we start out talking about essentially the ways in which algorithms may perpetuate biases inadvertently because of the way they're structured or because of the data that they are fed which may not, in fact, be a, a specifically human bias, but maybe you know, just the data that are going in there that end up discriminating against certain groups. So, and as you said, um, what the reason this is problematic is because just because there's a correlation doesn't mean there's a causation. So um, the, the bias may not reflect anything in particular. And also, um, the algorithm may be accurate, and the accuracy is questionable, but um, accuracy doesn't equal fairness. So that's what we've got so far. So the question then is left, what, what do we do about this? Because it seems like there are three areas for action. One is people, consumers, um, demanding their rights or demanding fairer treatment. One is the law. And one is uh, the companies that provide the services or that run the algorithms changing their practices. And, one, and so there's a question of what are the pressures on those companies? Is it the law, is it, or is it consumer demand? Is it a combination of both? So in short, how do we, when we encounter problems of algorithms doing things that seem to be unfair, A, how do we know about it? And B, how, what do we do about it? So the, the how do we know, actually, the how, the how do we know about part, it, part of it is not simple. But I mean, one, one could say, very simply, transparency. Um, and, but I think that's, that's, it's really difficult to know exactly what that means in this context. Transparency about what and what degree of transparency to whom. Uh, the, your average consumer is not really equipped, even if uh, uh, your, your average consumer is not really well equipped to, um, to evaluate how algorithms work or even necessarily what data inputs are going in. But I think that at a basic level, um, transparency about what information is going in and, and how it might be used to make decisions that could impact the individual. Um, that very rough level of transparency to the individual is important. And I think uh, for, from the regulator's perspective, um, full transparency, full insight into what all of the inputs might possibly be um, and, and into, into how, it, how it works. Um, uh, is important, but I'm, uh, David probably has more thoughts on how transparency could be actualized. Because I, I, uh, I, I can, I can, uh, I can offer a, a slightly more optimistic take, perhaps, which is that I do think that that more transparency in the relationship with users can be good, if not necessarily in sort of a, uh, you know, in a verif verifiability way, but just in terms of creating more of a conversation. That if Facebook shows you, okay, here are 30, you know, keywords that we associate with your interests, and people start looking at them and you know start seeing horrible things, you know, that can start a conversation that Facebook other, you know, that might get Facebook to react and sort of set up those sorts of feedback loops. So, I I think we should. It, it's it is important not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and at least. At, experiment with setting up more transparent structures so that we can at least see uh, see what's going on both to raise 
awareness in sort of the average consumer and in the co companies themselves because as we've seen in the past there are cases in which the companies do not realize how awful something has been until it accidentally pops up there was a horror story with Google like a couple of months ago in terms of uh, certain suggested tags they had for uh, for a person's uh, Google Photos pictures and I won't go more into it just let's just say the tags were not good and you know one but because the person saw these tags that allowed that feedback loop to be set up had you know had those tags not be exp being, been exposed to the customer that the that particular process may just have sort of let sit sat there latent latently and you know had unknown other effects so Will it fix everything? No, but will it at least be a step in the right direction? Yes, I do think that that can be a good thing. And because I think this, the path towards regulation is pretty slow in going, I think that sort of you know, policy apparatus is really sort of behind in terms of just getting to grips with these issues. I think that that's something we can do at least in the short term that will at least sort of ameliorate some of, the, some of these dangers. Yeah, and I do, I think some due diligence in the design stage, I mean, thinking about how these outputs are likely to be used. Are they likely to be used to make decisions um, uh, about, uh, about an individual that could impact their livelihood, education, um, healthcare, employment, um, are you, it, sentencing? And, and, and if so, um, I think it's really, it's really important for companies or whoever it is that's processing the data um, to, to take care to think about how bias might enter in and to, and to take steps to correct for um, to correct for possible biased outcomes from, from the beginning of the design process. And I think that this is something that regulators are looking into. There's, I know that, that a couple of the agencies here in DC have been thinking about it. They've been thinking about this as a, as a fairness issue for, for individuals, for consumers. Um, and they've been thinking about it under a few existing legal frameworks that we have for, to, to, to promote fairness that maybe we just haven't quite figured out how they, how they fit this bucket of work so far. But but I, I think the problem with transparency and fairness is in part that you, you know, if you are being discriminated against by, let's say, an algorithm that sets credit scores, you won't see that because you know, you'll see that your credit score is however, however much. And you won't be able to see that actually on average um, other people live in your district or other people of the same racial, eth racial ethnic group as you are on average being given lower scores than you know, other people in similar situations. Um, and it's only when somebody somehow manages to get a look at the aggregate picture, mm -hmm. and that somebody might be a journalist, let's say, or you know, something like that, only then does the unfairness come out. And then it then becomes a problem of proving that there is actually algorithmic disparate impact, right? There was a, uh, I think, pretty important Supreme Court ruling in the summer, which was, uh, I forget now the details, but it was about housing policy, and it was one of the first times, or possibly the first time, that the Supreme Court had allowed disparate impact mm -hmm. to be used as evidence of racial bias. Right. Before that, it had insisted that, you know, to show racial bias, you actually have to show intent of racial bias. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's a, a step forward, but those cases are hard to prove, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, we and we do. I think, you know, for a lot of good policy reasons, we do have a lot of uh, a lot of our legal framework is sort of is based on this idea that um, that to to find discrimination, there's, you know, we we want we we're most concerned about discrimination when it happens based on on some some immutable characteristic about an individual, something they can't change about themselves, and when the when the when the party that is engaging in discrimination is doing so in an intentional. Um, deliberate way. That said, I, I also think that you know we do have a legal framework to require um, due diligence. You know, sort of reasonable steps uh, that that companies might take to prevent the most unfair outcomes um, that exists. The, the Federal Trade Commission Act has you know has has pretty broad authority to to prohibit unfair and deceptive acts in trade, which is, you know, again, very broad, um, uh, and, and has been looking into this issue and thinking about how, wh where, you know, where that fits in, what, what might constitute an unfair practice when you are taking information about individuals and using it to make decisions about their lives. All right, well, David, since you're the computer guy, I'm gonna leave you the last word to ask you, are you basically optimistic that um, the law and consumer associations and society can move fast enough to uh, keep up with the kinds of changes that um, 
that, uh, that happen in, com in computer science and in development that, that create these biases. Because it seems to me like the law tends to, and the you know, government and policy tends to move slowly, and uh, computing moves quickly. I think things will be very, uh, especially once we move towards more analysis of video rather than text and images, things are going to change very quickly. My hope is that the issues provoked by video will sort of put this much more on people's radar than yeah. it is now. Specifically meaning? I, just meaning sort of what data is incorporated from, from videos people are uploading, videos that are taken of people without their permission, things like that. Right. Uh, that I think that these issues I think will come into much more sharp relief than they are now when you just sort of have an online profile. Right, okay, well thank you both very much.